uh, a good program because it is sort of an overview of some of Ohio's most important um, contributions to the suffrage mm -hmm. movement. Mm -hmm. um, it's broad, not deep, um, because right. of time. One because thing, of time. and also anyway, you know. So. Yeah. Well, um, if you are all ready, I will go ahead and I'll hit broadcast and open up for our panelists, and I'll do the introduction. We can go from there. We're good. All right. Here we go. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today as we start our 19th Amendment Celebration Week of the Lifelong Scholars Week at Lakeside. Uh, my name is Dakota Harkins. I'm Director of Education and Heritage Programming here at Lakeside. And as I said, this whole week, we will be celebrating 100 years anniversary of the passage of the 19th Amendment, which actually happened on August 26, 1920. Um, that was when uh, the, the 19th Amendment was certified, I should say. It was a long process, and there's a lot of details that we'll go ahead and learn about this week. Um, today's program, which is sponsored by the Lakeside Heritage Society, is going to focus specifically on Ohio's role in the suffrage movement. And joining us today is Dr. Catherine Durack. And Dr. Durack is the originator of the Genius of Liberty podcast series, which is about Ohio and the fight for suffrage. And she's actually Ohio's uh, representative on the National Turning Point Suffragist Memorial Association and is a member of the 2020 Women's Vote Centennial Initiative. Um, we were talking about a number of the initiatives that are happening and going to hopefully continue through this year with all the changes that have happened. Um, but thank you for joining us this, or this afternoon, Dr. Durack. How are you? I'm great. It's a pleasure to be here. Good, good. Well, I will turn it over to you now and um, okay. mute myself and we'll go ahead and get started. All right. So it'll take me just a second here to share my screen and get rolling. And all right. Uh, so, well, it, it truly is a pleasure to be with all of you today. I'm delighted to be here. Um, as Dakota just mentioned, uh, this month, the United States marks the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, which secured for women nationwide the right to vote. Now, millions of women from over four generations fought for our right to vote, yet most of us know very little about the suffragists and their history. Now, the story of woman's suffrage in the United States uh, is typically said to have begun with the first Women's Rights Convention in Seneca Falls, New York in 1848. Uh, this is a time when the Ohio River bustled with steamboats and Cincinnati was the first stop to freedom for fugitive slaves. The reality is that race has always been an important dynamic of the fight for women's suffrage. And the centennial story is incomplete if we fail to acknowledge that the 19th Amendment was only a partial victory as it would be another 45 years before women of color were empowered to join their sister Americans at the polls. The story of woman suffrage in Ohio reflects this complicated past. It is a story of courage, persistence, and clout. Three reasons that I believe we should be celebrating the centennial of the 19th Amendment. Now in 1848, the same year that Fontaine and Porter captured this wonderful image of Cincinnati's riverfront, while white women in Seneca Falls, New York modeled their statement of freedom on the Declaration of Independence, freed women in Cincinnati used washboards and shovels to fend off slave catchers harassing blacks in the city. And in Cleveland in 1848, Frederick Douglass led a three-day convention which passed its own Declaration of Sentiments and became the first national convention with participation by men and women when a Mrs. Sanford was permitted to speak. She concluded her statement with these words, to the delegates, officers, people and spirit of this convention, I would say God speed you in your efforts for freedom. Stop not, shrink not, look not back until you have justly secured an unqualified citizenship 
of the United States and those inalienable rights granted you by an impartial creator. Courage, then, is the first of my three reasons our nation needs to hear about the struggle for women's suffrage in Ohio. It seems especially fitting to begin with the story of a group of Ohio students whose protest a decade before Seneca Falls had a lasting effect on abolition and women's rights. In 1834, students at Lane Seminary in Walnut Hills held a series of fiery debates on slavery over 18 days. They converted many to abolition, formed an anti-slavery society, and committed to supporting the Black population in Cincinnati. Shortly thereafter, when the school was threatened by an angry mob, an alarmed board of trustees decided to abolish the anti-slavery society and to forbid student associations. Objecting to these actions, dozens of students and one of the trustees, Asa Mahan, walked out. Many ended up at Oberlin College, recently founded in Northern Ohio. Mahan was offered the presidency and as a condition for acceptance, he required that black students be admitted, making Oberlin the first college in the country to admit both women and men, black and white. Generations of leaders have been educated at Oberlin, including several of the participants in that 1848 convention I just mentioned. Women leaders included Lucy Stone and Antoinette Brown, classmates, abolitionists, women's rights activists, and eventually sisters-in-law when they married the Blackwell brothers, Henry and Samuel. Lucy Stone shocked the nation by keeping her maiden name when she married Antoinette Brown Blackwell, became the very first woman to be ordained as a mainstream Protestant minister. Anna J. Cooper and Mary Church were also classmates as well as activists and educators. Anna Cooper became one of the country's foremost African-American scholars and was the first, fourth African-American woman to earn a PhD. Her book, A Voice from the South, is one of the very first articulations of Black feminism. I'll have a little bit more to say about Mary Church uh, a little bit later. Now, not everyone from Lane Seminary ended up at Oberlin. Theodore Dwight Weld, one of the leaders of the Lane Rebels, went on a speaking tour for which he is credited with abolitionizing Ohio. Eventually, he recruited two Southern women to the American Anti-Slavery Society, Sister Sarah and Angelina Grimke. It wasn't long before the sisters discovered that in order to argue against slavery, they first had to argue for a woman's right to speak in public. Angelina appealed directly to Northern women. We do not and cannot concede that because slavery is a political subject, women ought to fold their hands in idleness and close their eyes and ears to the horrible things that are practiced in our land. Sarah was just as direct. Men and women were created equal. They are both moral and accountable beings and whatever is right for man to do is right for woman. Although the sisters gave up speaking when Angelina married Theodore, they continued their activism for abolition and women's rights. In 1850, the Anti-Slavery Bugle published this meeting announcement inviting citizens across the state to meet in Salem, Ohio to prepare a statement of facts or a memorial uh, to be submitted to the Ohio Constitutional Convention. Organizers advocated equal rights, regardless of sex or color. This meeting made history. It was the first women's rights meeting west of the Alleghenies. And the main outcome of the meeting was a memorial that requested equal voting, political, and legal rights for women. But that's not all. There was another significant and remarkable fact about the meeting. It was the first 
public meeting to be organized and run entirely by women. Men were permitted to attend, but they were not allowed to speak or to vote. For the first time in the world's history, according to this account by Paulina Wright Davis, men learned how it felt to sit in silence when great questions were pending. Never did men so suffer, Davis reported. Nevertheless, at the close, the men endorsed and organized, organized and endorsed all that the women had said and done. Planning and carrying out this meeting was a courageous undertaking, and it made a lasting impression on those who attended. I'm gonna digress for a moment and introduce you to this gentleman, John Allen Campbell, who was the first territorial governor of Wyoming. Now, shortly after Campbell became governor, the Wyoming Territorial Legislature passed a bill establishing equal voting rights for women, a bill that was specifically designed by the opposing political party to make Campbell look bad when he rejected it, because that's what he was expected to do. Much to everyone's surprise, Governor John Campbell signed the bill into law, making Wyoming the first place in the United States with equal voting rights for women and men. Why did he sign the bill? Well, there were undoubtedly many reasons, but among them was this. Campbell grew up in Salem, Ohio, and as a teenager, he had slipped into that women's rights convention. The events he witnessed there left him with a lifelong confidence in women's ability to participate in democracy. The official proceedings of the next Ohio Women's Rights Convention held in Akron in 1851 omitted the words of a black woman from New York who took the floor. Fortunately, the anti-slavery bugle published an account of the speech for which the entire convention would later become famous. I am a woman's rights. I have as much muscle as any man and can do as much work as any man. I have heard much about the sexes being equal. I can carry as much as any man and I can eat as much too if I can get it. The more widely known version of this speech, written in an unlikely heavy Southern dialect, was provided by this woman, Frances Dana Gage, in an account published more than a decade after Sojourner Truth asked, ain't I a woman? Now this is the genius of Liberty, one of the very first feminist newspapers in the United States. And it was edited and published in Cincinnati by Elizabeth Aldrich. Now in the issue shown here, Aldrich speaks to the women of the United States and she proclaims 18 causes that she believes women should advocate to preserve and protect our democracy. Among these causes are free public schools that include physical education for all students, uh, the admission of women to any trade or profession, equality of the sexes, equal pay for equal work, and a woman's right to vote. The 18th principle was this, that a true democracy should give both sexes everywhere the right, liberty, and encouragement to use their own capacities, powers, and abilities in their own way, untrammeled by any extrinsic hindrance or impediment, freely, liberally, and in accordance with their own taste, judgment, and inclination. Now, prior to the Civil War, Ohio was the only place outside of New York to host more than one national woman's rights convention. The fourth was in Cleveland in 1853, and the sixth was in Cincinnati in 1855. Now, Frances Dana Gage, who I just introduced you to, she presided over that Cleveland convention. And woman's rights newcomer, Susan B. Anthony, not yet among the speakers, uh, served on the finance committee. Now, as they did with 
most women's rights meetings, the press ridiculed Cincinnati's convention, calling organizers the vote and wear men's clothes women, and noting that members of the huge crowd that attended included women in bloomers and men in shawls. One of the strong-minded women who led the convention was Martha Coffin Wright, a planner of the 1848 Seneca Falls Convention, sister of Quaker activist Lucretia Mott, and cousin of Levi Coffin, a conductor on the Underground Railroad. Characterized as the master spirit of the 1853 convention by the Cleveland Plain Dealer, the opening spe uh, speaker in Cincinnati was Ernestine Rose, one of the best known and admired orators of the day, and one of the chief organizers of women's rights conventions before the Civil War. A Polish immigrant and a rabbi's atheist daughter, Rose left home, country, and wealth at 17 after rejecting an arranged marriage. Though shunned by most of her feminist colleagues for her atheism and her Jewish origins, she was a lifelong friend of Susan B. Anthony who described Rose as the bravest and most fearless of women. For example, while lecturing in the South, Rose received a thinly veiled threat from a slaveholder who remarked that as an abolitionist, she would have been tarred and feathered had she not been a woman. Rose retorted, you are so exceedingly lazy and inactive here because the slaves did all the work. Were it even to give me a coat of tar and feathers, it would be an act of charity to give you something to do. Rose fought ardently against slavery and for free thought and women's rights. She battled for integration as well as equality for which she was dubbed the new Fanny Wright. Rose is actually shown in that photograph posed in imitation of Wright. Like Ernestine Rose, Frances Wright was an immigrant, an abolitionist, and a champion of American democracy and social equality. Most significantly, Frances Wright was the very first public orator in the United States for which she con was condemned and regularly threatened with violence. Nearly 30 years before the 1855 convention in Cincinnati, Wright launched what became a national speaking career in 1828. Both Wright and Rose were inspired by the ideals embodied in the Declaration of Independence, and they advocated equal education because in Wright's words, women hold the destinies of humankind. Though the inscription is worn by time, you can still make out these words on Wright's monument in Spring Grove Cemetery in Cincinnati. And that is the tall monument with the portrait on it that you see there. It says in Wright's words, I have wedded the cause of human improvement, staked on it my fortune, my reputation, and my life. Persistence. When we think of suffragists like Susan B. Anthony, we tend to think of them like this, as old women. By conservative estimates, it took 72 years, nearly double the average lifespan in the 19th century, for women to secure a constitutional amendment granting them the right to vote in the United States. The very longevity of the suffragists became a reason for ridiculing them. The newspapers taunted Miss Anthony, who they claimed, after nearly year, uh, 30 years of public speaking for women's rights, hadn't been kissed and actually had developed corns on her tongue. We forget that when they began the fight, many of the early leaders of the suffrage movement were young women in their 20s and 30s. Few of them would even live long enough to see victory and the fight would be won by later generations of suffragists, to many of whom Anthony, who never married, was Aunt Susan. Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Lucy Stone both married and bore daughters who carried on the fight. And here we see Harriet Stanton Blatch and Alice Stone Blackwell as leading suffragists in the early 20th century. 
Now, activists who started out in Ohio dedicated their lives to the cause as well, working coast to coast and cradle to grave. Here are several examples. This is Caroline Severance, an abolitionist and women's rights activist. Born in New York, Caroline married a Cleveland banker and so began her activism in Northeast Ohio. In the 1850s, she was among the state leaders of Ohio's women's rights efforts. In 1855, uh, Severance left Cleveland for Boston and there, with several friends, founded the New England Women's Club, one of the very first women's clubs in the United States. In the 1870s, uh, Severance left Boston and moved to California, where she became a leader in the West Coast woman suffrage movement, and where she was able to vote for president when California granted equal suffrage to its female citizens in 1911. Mary Church Terrell, one of the Oberlin graduates I mentioned earlier, had deep connections to Ohio. In the 1870s, Mary, the daughter of freed slaves, was sent north at about age five to begin her education in Yellow Springs. In 1884, she became one of the first African-American women to earn a college degree graduating from Oberlin. And in 1909, she became a charter member of the NAACP, one of only two Black women invited to sign the call. In 1913, Mary Church Terrell insisted that Black women be permitted to march in the historic suffrage parade in Washington, D.C. And in 1950, having witnessed the deterioration of Black civil rights over her lifetime, when she is in her 80s, Mary Church Terrell started what would become a successful fight to integrate eating places in the District of Columbia with tactics including boycotts, picketing, and sit-ins. The court ruled in June 1953 that segregated eating places in Washington, D.C. were unconstitutional. Mary Church Terrell died in 1954. Daughter of Isaac M. Wise, the founder of Reform Judaism, Helen Wise Maloney was a leader in Ohio's suffrage movement, as was Rabbi Wise's granddaughter, Alice Bernheim Weil. What of the rabbi himself? Well, there's a Mr. Wise who is mentioned in newspaper coverage of the 1855 Cincinnati Convention, whose comments actually prompted an extemporaneous speech by Lucy Stone about being a disappointed woman. While it seems likely that this uh, speaker was not the rabbi, given the national prominence of Ernestine Rose at the convention, it seems very likely that Rabbi Wise and other members of his congregation were in the audience. Indeed, in a letter Lucy Stone wrote to Susan B. Anthony about the event, uh, Stone remarked upon the large number of Jews in Cincinnati. What is clear is that by 1867, Rabbi Wise was meeting periodically with suffragists and former abolitionists, including Caroline Severance, Lucretia Mott, and Robert Dale Owen, who was a colleague of Ernestine Rose in the free thought movement. And there is this intriguing headline, which suggests that Rabbi Wise shared the stage in Cincinnati with Reverend Anna Howard Shaw, a national leader of the women's suffrage movement. Toledo's Pauline Pearl Mutter-Steinem was a leader of several women's organizations, and she led the Ohio Women's Rights Association from 1908 to 1911. When elected to school board in 1904, she may have become the very first Jewish woman elected to any public office in the United States. And of course, I must mention that her granddaughter, Gloria, continued the fight for women's rights. Clout. If you're from Ohio, you probably know already that more U.S. presidents have come from the state than any other state except Virginia. What you may not have realized is that presidents from Ohio and Kentucky governed the United States for 28 years, more than one third of that 72-year struggle from 1848 
to 1920. And between 1860 and 1920, more than half of US presidents were from Ohio. And although I've included Lincoln here, that, that fact remains the same, half, more than half were from Ohio. Now, as to their attitudes on woman suffrage, most were opposed, although a few gave suffragists glimmers of hope. I wondered, what about their wives? Should we be surprised that these powerful men married strong-minded women, several of whom favored woman suffrage? Why then did these presidents refuse to support extending the ballot to their wives and other women? Carrie Chapman Cat, I sorry about the noise here. Carrie Chapman Catt, the last president of the National American Woman Suffrage Association and the founder of the League of Women Voters, offered her perspective in a tell-all book published in 1923. In short, Catt believed that the U.S. was preceded by 26 other countries in granting equal voting rights to women because of politics. It was the control of public sentiment, the deflecting and the thwarting of public sentiment through the trading and the trickery, the buying and the selling of American politics. From Kat's book and those written by others of that last fighting generation, it became clear to me that the single greatest impediment to the 19th Amendment was the fearsome power of the black female vote. Let me explain. Now, it's particularly important to consider the impact of the Civil War on the woman suffrage movement if we are to understand why victory took so long. When the Civil War started in 1861, suffragists set aside their demands to support the war effort. After the Emancipation Proclamation freed Confederate slaves in 1863 and the Civil War ended two years later, suffragists came together in a new organization, the American Equal Rights Association. They proposed the best way forward for the country was universal suffrage, enfranchising persons of color and women. But the women's rights activists were betrayed by the male abolitionists who had formerly been their closest allies. Wendell Phillips declared that this was the Negro's hour and disavowed that there had ever been any connection between women's rights and abolition. Phillips believed it was essential to fight only one battle at a time and he declared that women's cause must wait. By withdrawing their support of women's rights rhetorically and financially, the abolitionists sparked a civil war within the women's rights movement, a rift that would not be healed for decades. In May of 1869, the American Equal Rights Association split into two groups as factions decided whether to continue the fight for woman suffrage or to support ratification of the 15th Amendment, granting suffrage to freedmen alone. Two national organizations resulted. The first to be formed was the National Woman Suffrage Association, led by Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton, and which notoriously accepted funding from white supremacist George Francis Train. Lucy Stone and Julia Ward Howe were among the leaders who later that year convened a meeting in Cleveland, Ohio, to form the American Woman Suffrage Association. Now, ultimately, three Reconstruction Amendments were added to the Constitution, all ratified while former Confederate states were being reorganized, their loyalty to the Union tested, and their votes on ratification coerced. Ulysses S. Grant took office in 1869 in the first election after the Civil War. Now he won the popular vote uh, by a fairly small margin, it seemed to me, just over 5%, uh, but he did so at a time when Texas, Mississippi, and Virginia still were not restored to the Union and thus their citizens could not vote in the election. 
Now, after the 15th Amendment was ratified in February 1870, Grant established the Justice Department to aggressively enforce the provisions of the three Reconstruction Amendments, and he deployed federal troops to protect the rights of freed men and women who were in, uh, being terrorized in the South by the Ku Klux Klan. Southerners were not alone in paying close attention to the new amendments to the Constitution and how they were going to be interpreted and enforced. Ohio-born Victoria Woodhull, spiritualist, suffragist, and first female stockbroker on Wall Street, became the first woman to address a committee of the U.S. House of Representatives in December of 1870. Having carefully studied the 14th Amendment, which defined U.S. citizenship and asserted equal protection under the law, and the 15th Amendment, which for the first time explicitly stated that citizens have a right to vote and that they have that right despite race, color, or previous condition of uh, servitude, Woodhull argued that these new, new amendments legally enfranchised women, all women, black and white, the right to vote. A year and a half later, in May 1872, Victoria Woodhull became the very first woman to run for president of the United States. The nominee of the Equal Rights Party, in the end, Grant easily won a second term. That's not too surprising. But Woodhull's candidacy and the attempts of suffragists, including Susan B. Anthony, to vote in the election emphasized the importance of the Reconstruction Amendments to determining who could vote and who could not. Given the very real threats to established power posed by potential new voters, it's no surprise that the election of 1876 was characterized by ballot stuffing and widespread violence across the South. Ohio's Rutherford B. Hayes won in a bitterly contested election. Hayes actually lost the popular vote by 3%, but he won the Electoral College by a single vote. Southerners agreed to accept Hayes as president only if he removed federal troops from the South. Afterward, from 1890 to 1908, Southern state legislators, legislators created new state constitutions, passed new constitutional amendments, and instituted new laws that made voter registration and voting more difficult. They succeeded in disenfranchising most of their black citizens, as well as many poor whites in the South, and voter rolls dropped dramatically. Taking office after William Howard Taft, Woodrow Wilson reinstituted segregation in the US Capitol. Uh, it's a mark of my white privilege that when I began to read accounts of the final years of the fight for women's suffrage, I was truly shocked to see that more than a half century after the end of the Civil War, race remained a crucial issue. In this article from June 1919, one of, of many similar articles, the governor of Louisiana says this, our Southern states have been unanimously opposed to the 15th Amendment, and if we now ratify the 19th Amendment, we will be stopped from opposing the enactment of force bills by Congress in aid of Negro political equality, which will lead eventually to a struggle on their part for social and other equalities. Suffragist Maud Wood Park had this to say about what she had heard from members of Congress on Capitol Hill. As a man had said in an unguarded moment, the real reason we Southerners don't want woman suffrage is that we can club the men away from the polls if we have to, but we couldn't do that with the women. For Southerners, the 19th Amendment was just too close to the 15th. Here are the words of the 15th Amendment. And here you see the 19th. Now, when the United States entered World War I, suffragists were again expected to set aside their demands as they had at the start of the Civil War. The National Woman's Party refused. Here, Alice Paul carries a banner quoting President Wilson's words about entering World War I. The time has come to conquer or submit. For us, there is but one choice, and we have made it. <laughs> 
Because of the courage and persistence of suffragists like these, and despite significant race-based opposition, Congress passed the 19th Amendment on June 4th, 1919. Ratification was the next battle. Ratification of a constitutional amendment is a numbers game. Two thirds of the members of both houses of Congress have to approve the proposed amendment before it can be sent to the states for ratification. Then three fourths of the states must agree. They must ratify the amendment if it is to be adopted into law. That moment after the Civil War, when abolitionists rejected universal suffrage to secure the 15th Amendment, a move that preserved patriarchy despite race at the expense of all women, that moment has been painted as the moment when suffragists turned their backs on their African-American sisters by proposing a 16th Amendment to enfranchise women. The truth is their hand was forced. If suffragists held fast to their roots in abolition, the fight was done before it was begun. Although 11 states had joined the union since 1870, it was still true in 1920 that all it would take to defeat the 19th amendment was for the 13 former Confederate states to vote as a block. In 1920, 36 of 48 states had to ratify the 19th Amendment to make it law. The ratification proceeded quickly at the start. Uh, victory by, was by no means certain. By March 1920, only one more state was needed. States that had ratified the 19th Amendment are shown in this map in white. Uh, of those remaining, eight had considered and defeated the amendment, and of the five states left, that's Connecticut, Florida, North Carolina, Tennessee, and Vermont, not one had a regular session of the legislature scheduled in 1920. Now, ultimately, two states called special sessions, North Carolina, where the amendment was defeated, and Tennessee. This is where things get interesting. 1920 was a presidential election year, and both candidates were from Ohio, James M. Cox and Warren G. Harding. The candidates, as leaders of their political parties, could use their clout to influence the outcome. Seven years earlier, in 1913, Harriet Taylor Upton of Warren, Ohio, a national leader in the woman suffrage movement, argued that Ohio must lead the fight for equal rights. In 1920, Alice Paul agreed, the real battleground was not in Tennessee, but in Ohio. Warren G. Harding listened to the suffragists and evaded. James M. Cox, on the other hand, assured the suffragists of his support, and he kept his promise. The result made history. In August 1920, the Tennessee legislature ratified the 19th Amendment with a one-vote margin. Many gave Cox credit for the victory. To win the vote, suffragists had to be fearless. These women are among the hundreds who in 1917 were the first persons in history to picket the White House. They stood in silence as they were taunted, jeered, spat upon, and attacked by people in the street. When the police arrived, it was the suffragists who were arrested, beaten while in custody, and sentenced to prison for standing on a sidewalk in silence, holding a sign. Doris Stevens was educated at Oberlin and recruited to the National Women's Party from Dayton, Ohio. She became the youngest member of the National Executive Committee and is among those who were arrested and served time at Occoquan Workhouse. She and her companions are shown here in prison uniforms. Stevens' book, Jailed for Freedom, published in 1920, inspired the 2004 film, Iron Jawed Angels. Black suffragists needed even greater courage, just as it had after the ratification of the 15th Amendment. Membership in the Ku Klux Klan skyrocketed when women gained the vote. 
By 1924, Ohio was one of several Northern states with greater membership in the Klan than any single state south of the Mason-Dixon line. The story of the fight for women's suffrage in Ohio is a story of clout, persistence, and courage. Ohio became a place where a woman could speak boldly, Women could sing loudly. Here you see the Cincinnati girl, who is the inspiration for this feminist song, Take Me Out to the Ball Game. And women could fly high. The rights were promoters, uh, advocates of women's suffrage. This is Lita Richburg Hornsby, who you can see here with her flying machine getting ready for a suffrage flight. So how should we mark this centennial? I ask that you join me and add your name to the history of women's suffrage. Here's how. First of all, let's remember the women who committed their uh, lives to our right uh, to vote and uh, and help build the Turning Point Suffragist Memorial, a new national memorial at the site where suffragists were imprisoned 100 years ago at what is now Occoquan Regional Park. Uh, ground has broken on this memorial. I hope you'll be able to visit at some point in the future. Second, we should celebrate. We should be proud of Ohio's rich suffrage history. So let's celebrate the civil rights amendment that legally enfranchised half the population in a single day. Last and most important, we should honor their memory by getting informed, getting involved and voting. Thank you. And let's thank those 5 million women who use their voices to give us ours. And if you liked these stories today, I hope you will take a moment to listen to some of the six minute suffrage stories on my share in the Genius of Liberty podcast. Dakota, nice to see you again. Yes, I popped back up here. Well, thank you so much. Um, that was amazing. There's a lot of information uh, in, in that presentation alone, but I know that you have a long list of podcasts as well. So um, as she said, you can go to the library that she's provided there, that link. And we'll also be putting up um, a document online on the Lakeside uh, calendar. And it's also gonna be in the Lakeside Heritage Society Facebook page if you want links to more of the podcast that uh, Dr. Durek has, has published or produced, I should say. Um, I had a few quick questions after watching sure. that, but, but first I would like you to uh, tell the story you were telling me just before we started about um, President Taft and maybe a connection that we have here. Sure. So one of the things I was sharing with Dakota is that the Ch Chautauqua wave the Chautauqua, I guess it was waving handkerchiefs, that was the way uh, that women would politely um, uh, applaud uh, and, and register their agreement during a speech. And I, I think, and so I, I, I haven't read this story for a while, but I believe that the, one of the first times I came across that, that term, the Chautauqua wave, was when President Taft, Ohio, of course, was the very first president uh, to uh, speak at, to welcome the women to Washington, D.C. for their national convention. And I think initially he was greeted with a Chautauqua wave, but when he confessed that he had changed his mind, and he, he actually had written that he, in high school that his, uh, he was in favor of suffrage, his parents were suffragists, but I guess as a politician he decided it was wise to switch positions. And when he confessed his uh, opposition to uh, women suffrage at this crowd of suffragists, the women hissed uh, to show their disapproval. And that made, that made national headlines all across the country. And uh, they had to do a very public apology for the total rudeness of hissing the president. Hissing at the president, the rude thing. Um, and then another question I had is you're going through too. I don't know if you can go back a couple slides, but if you can't, that's okay. 
Uh, but the the Take Me Out to the Ball Game song, I wondered if you could tell us a little bit more about that because I know I've heard the story a few times, but I think it's so interesting. Um, so would you would you like for me to take a second and see if I can pull that slide up? If you or, if you don't yeah. mind, just so we can look at the picture. Yeah. Okay. Oh. So yeah, okay. let's see what happens here. And Dakota, you tell me if weirdness happens. But I'll okay. get back to see here. So here is Trixie Forganza. So Trixie Forganza grew up in Cincinnati. Um, you can see here a few things about her. She started working at age 12 for $3 a week. Um, she discovered very soon that at, um, that she could actually earn more money uh, being in vaudeville than she could working at the department store. So she left home. By the way, this is there's a Genius of Liberty podcast about Trixie. Oh. So anyway, she left home and um, and went into vaudeville, and she ended up living moving to New York. Um, and when she's in New York, uh, her, her sash says uh, American suffragette. She starts her activism for women's suffrage. And about the same time, um, she becomes, she starts dating this fellow, Jack Norworth. Uh, and uh, she's considered the inspiration for this, this song. Um, the Giants and the Reds actually played a couple of games, uh, did some special suffrage day games. And Trixie was a huge baseball fan, and she was undoubtedly in the stands. Um, and so she, she was a huge fan. Uh, Norworth himself uh, didn't see his first major league game until many, many years later. So even though Norworth dumps Trixie and ends up popularizing this song with um, another actress, who he later marries, um, Trixie is considered the star. So there's a few more details I haven't included here that are in that six minute suffrage podcast. The, the, the song was a feminist, a considered feminist because a girl who, who would have thought that a girl would rather go to a baseball game uh, than to the theater. And that when she arrived, she would know how the game was played, be able to yell at the umps when they, made a bad call and she'd know all the players' names. So, so that's the story. That's a, in brief, the story of Trixie. Of Trixie. Well, that's great. And I think that's a really good teaser too for looking at uh, or listening to one of the podcasts uh, that you've made. And then one last question because it did come up on one of your last few slides on ways to get involved and ways to celebrate this year. Um, is there any way in particular that our viewers, um, our Lakesiders could get involved or contribute to the Turning Point Suffragist Memorial? Yeah, so um, Turning Point was fully funded until the pandemic. And mm -hmm. so uh, I, the last I heard, and it's been a little while, um, but the last I heard the several of the um, funders had had to rescind their gifts. So if any, any amount is helpful, if somebody wants to donate, um, even if they don't want to donate, just sharing information about Turning Point uh, is a great idea. They have a website. They have many stories about suffragists across the country. Um, uh, I might have to send you that URL, Dakota, if it's not in, mm -hmm. I don't remember if you have the link. Um, but e even just sharing information about Turning Point Suffragist Memorial. Actually, the latest news uh, that came out of there is a piece of the actual gate. So in the picture of the picketers, mm -hmm. um, let me pull that up. So I'm going to play this slide and then it will go. So you see the picket, the fence, the fence mm -hmm. rail. Mm -hmm some of the actual fence rail from Washington DC from the White House is actually gonna be installed at turning point. So some of the actual fence rail oh, wow. that the suffragists stood in, in front of has been, um, the park service has made it possible for that to go there. So she, honestly, getting out the word is huge. If you're able to make a donation, a donation in any amount would be helpful. Awesome. Okay. Well, that's, I mean, that's really neat that they're able to make that connection. Um, and we'll put the link then on our, our Lakeside Heritage Society Facebook page. So folks can go and uh, click on that and take a look at it too. Um, but thank you so much for joining us today. It has been such an outstanding start to our, our 19th Amendment 
uh, week-long celebration. So we really appreciate you being able to join us. We talked about, hopefully we'll have you back again in the future so you can be here with us on site. Uh, for those who are watching, please remember to mark on your calendars for this week on Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday. We actually have two lectures a day. So our typical 10.30 a.m. time, and then also at 1.30 p.m. Wednesday, we will just have a 10.30 in the morning lecture. Uh, but to access any of those, you can go to lakesideohio.com backslash calendar. And the purple banner that's at the top of the dates, um, clicking on that banner will take you to another page that has a list for all of those access points all week. Um, but again, we thank you for being with us here today, Dr. Durack. And if we have any questions that come through, we'll make sure to connect them with you um, in the future. And everyone go take a listen to the podcast. I'm sure there's a lot more that we uh, will be able to listen to this week as we're celebrating. So with that, uh, we are sending everyone our love from Lakeside and hope you have a wonderful rest of the day.